Tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Higher fines and tighter rules on short-term rentals in BC. If hosts are not playing by the rules, this legislation will require platforms to take down those listings. The provincial government pushes to get more housing into the long-term rental market. Plus, calls to beef up fire code enforcement in Vancouver after a blaze forced 70 people from their homes. New documents reveal what inspectors tried to do for years. And big visitor. And the reason we call them tanks is because of their incredible ability to dig through, well, most people's houses. Why was a tortoise in a Richmond farm field? This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, I'm Dan Burr. Thanks for joining us. The B.C. government is putting short-term rental operators on notice. It has tabled legislation meant to return housing rented out on platforms like Airbnb to the long-term rental market. And as Mira Baines shows us, that will include larger fines. The province is hoping new legislation will force people to take short-term rentals off platforms like Verbo and Airbnb. We have seen a 20% increase in the number of short-term rental listings in British Columbia in the last year alone to an all-time high of about 28,000 listings. The proposed law restricts short-term rentals to within a host's home, a basement suite or laneway home on the property where they live. Hosts who break the rules would be fined $3,000 a day, up from $1,000, and to help make people follow the rules. A new enforcement team that will support the efforts led by municipalities and regional districts. Short-term rental companies will be required to share data with the province and show business registration numbers on the listings. This will help local enforcement. If hosts are not playing by the rules, this legislation will require platforms to take down those listings. Airbnb's policy manager argues the proposed legislation won't ease BC's housing concerns, saying instead it will take money out of the pockets of British Columbians, make travel more unaffordable for millions of residents who travel within BC, and reduce tourism spending in communities where hosts are often the only providers of local accommodations. Callers on CBC Radio's BC Today were mixed. But philosophically, I'm opposed to the notion that government can just come in and tell me what to do with my property. In my neighborhood, I see brand new buildings being built that are being put up specifically for housing, and then they're being rented out as Airbnbs, like the whole property. The new rules could lead to fewer rooms for tourists in BC, but the mayor of Victoria says balance is key. Also, providing homes is a priority. Even moving some of those into the permanent housing market is going to make a significant difference. Resort communities and Gulf Islands will be exempt from principal residence requirements, but local governments can opt in. There's lots in here that uh, the whole community is going to have to weigh in on. Uh, STRs are part of our community. They, uh, they benefit Tofino, but they also, uh, as everybody knows, uh, bring some baggage. The provincial government says the new rules will be phased in from now through late 2024. Mira Baines, CBC News, Victoria. So some tough talk from the provincial government there, but this is not the first time they've tried to regulate short-term rentals. They first introduced legislation in 2018 that gave authority, authority to cities and towns on this issue. Joining us for more is our municipal affairs reporter, Justin McElroy. Justin, why does the province think this time will be different? Uh, the big difference is because the province is taking over oversight on the question of if somebody is renting out their primary residence, which is allowed, or a second home, which is not. Now, in the past, it was up to municipalities to try and figure this out if somebody put forward a complaint. And so it became sort of a whack-a-mole situation with bylaw officers, and in most municipalities, they don't have a lot of bylaws law officers to try and figure out who was telling the truth in this sort of situation. Now the provincial government already has all that tax documentation over what is the primary residence for someone. So in theory, if there is a complaint, if somebody is in the wrong and posting something on Airbnb or another website that they're not allowed to, it should be a short process to determine that they're in the wrong and to levy the fines and get those units, in theory, on the market to be rented to British Columbians. Now we heard from a few mayors 
who support this change today. Is that generally the view across BC, do you think? Well, it's generally the view among municipal politicians. I can tell you last month at the Union of BC Municipalities Convention, politicians from towns large and small were imploring the province to do something about short-term rentals, to get into this area more than they have in the past, saying it was a, simply a situation where they couldn't keep up with the demand and that they wanted more help. So certainly municipalities today generally smiling, whether the public does or not, well, you heard that the next all the regulations won't be in place until the end of next year. There's a provincial election scheduled in between then, so we'll see what the public thinks then. Indeed we will. Justin McElroy, thanks very much. To a very different housing story now, the number of people in Courtney without homes has doubled since before the pandemic. Experts say the increase is in part due to the fact this is where services are located for people. The population of unhoused is split 60-40 between men and women. During the count, respondents were asked why they didn't have homes. The number one reason was not enough income, followed by substance use, mental health struggles among them as well. Last was conflict with a spouse or partner. The mayor says he's disappointed in the increase, but not surprised. You throw in the pandemic, you throw in um, toxic drugs and, you know, opioid uh, epidemics, all that stuff. And just, the, the, again, those spiraling costs of, of uh, rentals and this is the outcome. This Super 8 motel was bought by the province to offer much needed low income housing. While there are a number of units like it, the mayor says they have not been able to keep up with demand. And as winter approaches, the city's main priority is finding space for temporary shelters to keep people safe and out of the cold. Students, parents and teachers are trying to find some balance after a Port Coquitlam Elementary School burnt to the ground over the weekend. That fire has been deemed suspicious and the wreckage is still smoldering. As Michelle Gassoub reports, students are learning about where they will go next as parents and guardians try to help them process the shock. It's been 48 hours since Hazel Trembath Elementary School burnt down, but even with all that time that has passed and the heavy rain that we've had, you can still smell a very powerful smell of smoke in the air. Uh, families are being warned to stay away from this site just because of how poor the air quality is here and how harmful that can be to children. What we're hearing from people today is that it's not just the physical school that was lost, the teaching material, the classrooms, but also memories and a sense of safety. Well, I want to be at my old, my back at my school. The gym, the classrooms, the whole school. I came running out of the room crying and letting my husband know about what had just transpired. And we were in shock and dismay. Um, my kids have been having a lot of questions that I don't have answers to. Um, and my worry is that the school will be split up um, once we move back to Port Coquitlam. She has been very sad because it's, it's part of her life. Her normal is her school, so it has been very hard on her. And as a parent, you need to navigate them so they grieve what they have lost. But you're grieving as a parent too, so it's, it's very hard. The students who lost their school over the weekend will now begin attending classes at the Winslow Centre. That's a building about a 20 minute bus ride from here and they are set to resume classes either Wednesday or Thursday of this week. They will also be taking in donations because of course lots of teaching material was lost in this fire. There also is confirmation they will be rebuilding school at this site, but at this point the timeline for that is unknown. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Port Coquitlam. Tenant advocates want the city of Vancouver to step up fire code enforcement after 70 people were forced from their homes by an accidental apartment blaze in July. As Moira Whiten shows us, new documents obtained by CBC News show inspectors tried for years to get the building's owners to bring it up to code. Tenants at 414 East 10th Avenue lived in fear for years as fire code violations stacked up more than 30 in the last two years before it burned down. City inspection reports offer a glimpse at how hard it was for staff trying to get the sprinkler system and alarms fixed, or to even get inside the building at all. Inspectors reported they found the fire alarm hadn't been serviced since 2018 and worried that blocked exits and holes in a ceiling could help a fire spread. They also said owners Fu Ren and Feng Yan were hard to get a hold of for months and denied they knew about many alleged issues at the building. 
During a 2020 meeting, one inspector reported Wren pulled the alarm to prove it was working, adding another ticket to the mounting fines and violations. A former assistant fire chief says it was a frustrating game of cat and mouse that plays out in other problem buildings across the city. That building is not any different than some of the other problem buildings in the city. And the issue is sometimes the owner is not available. Sometimes the owner makes themselves unavailable and it becomes very difficult to get in the building. Wren pled guilty to four charges in 2021 and the city took him to court again in May for more than 20 alleged offenses, some more than two years old. The owners have denied the charges and are fighting them in court, but didn't respond to a CBC request for comment. Bryant says it can take years to document violations and gather enough evidence to prosecute owners, especially if tenants are causing issues too. Have you given them a notice of violation? Then the next step is, have you, have you gone back for a reinspection fee? Have you fined them? And then you might get to some sort of prosecution, but that could take a year or more. The city says most fire violations are resolved quickly, but it could not comment on prosecution times. But tenant advocates say the fire never should have happened and want the city to increase fines and prosecute landlords more quickly. We're also facing a problem with the municipality and the property use agents, inspectors, managers at the city of Vancouver not doing what is necessary to prevent these kind of events from happening. A landlord advocacy organization says the city should focus on enforcement before looking at more regulation. Bryant says while most owners take good care of their properties, those who don't are putting renters' lives at risk. Moira Whiten, CBC News, Vancouver. Back to Victoria now. The provincial government is introducing legislation that aims to put an end to the Surrey policing saga. Public Safety Minister Mike Farnworth tabled that new law this afternoon in the legislature, and Surrey's mayor was quick to react. Here's more from Leanne Young. I'm going to be really clear. The city of Surrey has made a position. We're not uh, changing that position. Unswayed. That was the takeaway from Surrey's mayor, Brenda Locke, during her press conference this afternoon here at City Hall. The mayor was quick to make herself available to media after the public safety minister tabled the new legislation in Victoria. The legislation also contains provisions that provide clarity and finality to the people of Surrey regarding their ongoing transition. Mayor Locke spoke about an hour and a half after the new law was introduced, but it also meant she couldn't say very much. Provincial legislation was just released within maybe two hours, um, so we are still all in the in the process of reviewing it. We are still in the process of reviewing. We'll be reviewing the legislation, reviewing the uh, legislation. Interesting to note, Minister Mike Farnworth said that he offered Surrey City staff the chance to be briefed on the legislation before it was tabled. The city apparently did not take the province up on the offer. So what is the new legislation? It's an amendment to the Police Act called Bill 36. If passed, it will ban municipalities from reversing course in the middle of a policing transition. Minister Farmworth says it will mandate the city of Surrey to provide a municipal police force, essentially making the Surrey Police Service the agency of record over the RCMP here. He says it will, quote, provide finality to the ongoing transition, which has been bouncing back and forth for more than two years in this community. If I were the city of Surrey, I would say the province has made a decision um, and it's time for us to move forward. It's time to stop the delays and it's time to get on to moving towards the Surrey Police Service. Here in Surrey, Mayor Locke blames the province for delaying the process. She says the government could have made its decision months earlier than it did. Keep in mind, just three days ago, the city chose to take legal action against the province to put a stop to the transition. When I asked Mayor Locke if that was just adding to the delays, she says no. That's her sticking to the fight to ultimately save taxpayers money. The cost of running two police forces right now, it's an extra $8 million a month. As for how today's legislation will affect the legal petition, both the mayor and minister say that will go through its own legal process. Leanne Young, CBC News, Surrey. More than 600 Metro Vancouver workers are still on strike at all five wastewater plants. They want a new collective agreement from their employers after being without one for nearly two years. Picket lines are up at Anasis Island, Iona Island, Lionsgate, Lulu Island and Northwest Langley treatment plants.
where workers ordinarily help process one billion liters of wastewater, monitor air quality and build infrastructure. The union has been negotiating with Metro Vancouver for higher wages and enhanced benefits since before its last contract expired in December 2021. Metro Vancouver says job action will not disrupt essential services for now. This is not the kind of thing you expect to find in a farmer's field in Richmond. A tortoise normally found in Africa. And the veterinarian who's taking care of Frank the Tank explains why they're not a great pet for everybody. Uh, Salcatas account for probably 90% of the animals that we see surrendered or dumped uh, because of their large size. People get them when they're small and they're cuddly and cute and then when they reach 100 200 pounds and a little bit more than what they're intending to keep they wind up uh trying to rehome them and since there are no reptile rescues in british columbia they wind up in cases like this found wandering around it's a really tough time because the simple fact is a lot of people over covid got all of these really unusual pets dogs and cats, and now with everything changing, they're trying to find homes for them and they just aren't there. We got Fluffy when he was about two inches long. He uh, will be my daughter's pet and my granddaughter's pet and her child's pet. These can be wonderful pets if you take the time and effort and have long-term planning and family members who are willing to take on this animal after you die and they have children. As for Frank the Tank, he's in pretty rough shape right now. He has what they call shell rot and there are concerns about his past diet. They hope he rebounds and they could put him up for adoption for his forever home. The Richmond RCMP are facing backlash for a pedestrian safety video it's posted online. In it, a distracted driver nearly hits a woman in a crosswalk who's wearing dark clothing and has headphones in. The video is being criticized for placing equal safety onus on both the walker and the driver. At last check, the video has more than one million views. Have a look. To better understand why some people are not happy with the message in this video, we are now joined by Lucy Maloney from Vision Zero Vancouver. Your group is dedicated to reducing and eliminating traffic deaths, as I suppose as best as, uh, as, as can be. What went through your mind when you first saw this video? Well, the first thing that I noticed was that um, the girl that's crossing the road isn't doing anything illegal. She's, mm -hmm. she's pressed the button, she's on a marked crosswalk, she's paying attention, she's uh, not doing anything illegal. Mm -hmm. Whereas the driver is looking at their phone. So this girl could have been dancing across the crosswalk in a neon ball frock and this guy would not have seen her. Mm -hmm. So it's absolutely not an equivalent thing. Now, we have heard from the Richmond RCMP in a, in a statement they say, in part, the video is not about, quote, X being more right than Y. The purpose of the video is to reduce harm, save lives, create awareness, full stop, nothing more and certainly nothing less. Uh, I mean, as, as you mentioned, it shows somebody breaking the law and it shows somebody who's not doing that. How do you think they could have done a better job with, with perhaps subtleties when it comes to, because the message was uh, uh, a pedestrian safety is a two-way street? I think it shouldn't have been a surprise to the Richmond RCMP that this would be badly received. Mm -hmm. Every year we get public safety campaigns that are effectively victim blame. They put responsibility on vulnerable road users outside cars mm -hmm. to be responsible for their own safety. And that's, that's not really getting to the core of what causes traffic deaths and injuries on our roads. You know, we've got um, other things like the design of cars, the design of the infrastructure, that was a super wide road, uh, and driver behaviour, which is disproportionately responsible for terrible consequences. You know, the consequence for the driver would have been, oops, 
bang, mm -hmm. um, the, the consequence for the pedestrian would have been uh, serious injury or possibly even tragic consequences. If you were to design a video like this, what would you do? Well, uh, what I would do is I would have pic pictures of politicians listening to um, experts telling them about what really contributes to um, us reducing traffic deaths and injuries on our roads. And I'd have um, pictures of people telling police that enforcement is a really good idea and automated enforcement is a really good idea. Where I'm from, Australia, there's a lot more video enforcement of people using their phones, which doesn't require um, an individual police officer to pull people over mm -hmm. uh, and process them very slowly. You get uh, the first you know about it is that you get a ticket in the mail and that's in addition to on the street enforcement. And perhaps if the message hasn't landed, also perhaps a good reminder, even if it d wasn't uh, presented well, that if you are going to be crossing a road of some description and not trying to victim shame, that you want to look up, you want to make sure that you can see your surroundings. Well, I don't want to give that message because um, I'm concerned about um, the needs of children and vision and hearing impaired people and people who are using wheelchairs or other mobility devices that makes, make them sit lower on the road and are more visible. And I think that everybody outside cars is already brutally aware of keeping themselves safe on the roads. What we need to do is influence um, how our infrastructure is built so um, drivers get visual cues to go more slowly on our roads and we need to work on driver behaviour through enforcement. Lucy Maloney with Vision Zero Vancouver, thank you for joining us. Thank you. We have a new member of the CBC Vancouver News family to introduce you to. Please say hello to Neela Kaur Matu. She'll smile eventually, don't worry. A new baby daughter for our colleague Anita Bath and her husband Jot. There they are. Neela arrived on Lucky Friday, October 13th, weighing in at a good five pounds, seven ounces. Her big sister, Anya, there is already filled with tons of love for her new sibling. Congratulations, Anita and Jot and Anya, and nice to meet you, Neela. Health and happiness and love, and hopefully some better sleep and some more smiles for everybody. Isn't that happy, Darius? A new addition. That's so awesome for them. Oh, it is. But what a photo to start and end on. There's a much cuter <laughs> I, one. To be fair, I've had days like that. Yes. We all have. <laughs> uh, adorable. Yeah. Uh, do you know what's not adorable, Dan? Mm. Uh, rainfall warnings. Segway. Yeah, thank you. Which we have across the south coast because we've already had some pretty significant rainfall starting this morning and continue, or last night, actually, and continuing through today. You can see here the last 24 hours, a lot of that rainfall making its way in. Not as much of it breaking into the interior, although just over the last couple hours, some of it has. Over the next couple days, more of that rain will make its way into the interior as that ridge of high pressure that's keeping the interior dry starts to break down. So you see some more of that moving in here. But really, the story is here on the south coast. So over the next 24 hours, some significant rainfall, up to 50 millimeters in some parts of the west coast of the island. But as we continue to move into the next uh, 24 hours after that, so 48 hours out from now, we see as much as 100 millimeters or more building up on some parts of the island. And that's what the rainfall warnings are about. Because if we look at 60 hours, yeah, some incredibly significant rainfall, especially at higher elevations, but all along the west coast and a lot more than we usually see on the east coast of the island as well, because that rain shadow not completely keeping that side of the island dry. So these rainfall warnings, we're talking as much as 200 millimeters for the west coast, as much as 120 millimeters for the inland parts of the island, and up to 80 millimeters for the west coast, including Campbell River, which might get hit pretty hard according to some models. So we'll keep an eye out for that. Also, how sound getting some significant rainfall, 50 to 70 millimeters. I'm not going to fall over. Uh, we have a wind warning as well for the North Island, the Central Coast, and Haida Gwaii, which could see wind speeds as high as uh, gusting as high as 110 kilometers per hour with sustained wind speeds very high as well. And for inland parts of the North Coast, we're looking at rainfall up to 70 millimeters. So some pretty significant uh, impacts from the storm that's heading in. And we'll take a look at what is driving that rainfall mm -hmm. and that storm later this hour. Sounds good. Thanks, Darius. Thanks, Dan. Well, some 200 people gathered at Vancouver's Oppenheimer Park over the weekend for a free veterinary clinic. It gave pets and their human parents some vital care. As Janella Hamilton shows us, the need for these kinds of services is rising amid BC's growing affordability crisis.
Do wash your hands, okay? Otherwise, just let it dry on its own. Receiving pro bono animal care, pet food, supplies, and education. Invaluable services for many here. They're my everything. I don't have kids, so this is my kid, <laughs> my love. For a lot of owners, these are this is their person. This is their best buddy, their best friend. So they um, will prioritize getting food and getting shelter for their animals. Abby Berg says every day she has to choose between putting food on her table or feeding her pets. I'll feed my animals before I eat. If I have nothing in the fridge, you know, for myself, as long as my animals are good, you know, I'm good. It's a sacrifice many living on the downtown east side say they're often forced to make. A lot of people around here have pets and don't have access to veterinary services, which can be incredibly expensive. We step in and help with things like vaccines, which they can't access on their own, treatments for ear medications, referrals for spay neuter services. The increasing costs of vet services and added stress for pet owners living on low income, like 73-year-old Mike Kennedy. He says four-year-old Rocky has helped improve his physical and mental health. When I first got him, you know, I like, I couldn't believe how attached I got to him, you know, and I talked to a lot of people and how, how attached they are, you know, and how they basically he couldn't live without him. You know, it's really uh, it's the best thing that's happened to me. Kennedy says typically his seniors' home does not allow pets. Another challenge organizers say many in marginalized communities are facing. Not a lot of places are pet friendly, and the places that are are either restrictive sometimes with size or numbers. Just because they have a dog or cat doesn't shouldn't be a barrier to, you know, having a roof over their head or, you know, accessing preventative care for themselves. Kennedy says events like this free health clinic eases some of that burden. Nowadays with the rent going up and everything that's going on, like it's just, it's, you know, you got to kind of stretch your dollar to, you know, to get by. And But this place is like really saved me hundreds of dollars, really. The clinic also offering people a chance to get vital medical care, including flu and COVID vaccines and mental health support. Janela Hamilton, CBC News, Vancouver. Tomorrow marks five years since cannabis was legalized in Canada. We'll look at the health impacts in our live interview right after this. Hello to everyone watching our commercial free live stream. Thanks for being here. As Edmonton's downtown struggles to make significant progress in the wake of the pandemic, local business leaders are coming up with ways to revitalize the core. A key focus is restoring retail. And thanks to provincial funding, as the CBC's Alicia Asquith shows us, there are a number of new retailers moving in, hoping to make a difference. Wander through Edmonton's downtown and it's easy to recognize the challenges facing the core. Empty storefronts line streets that once teemed with activity pre-pandemic. We're going to go over what the context of the report is. Heather Thompson is behind a new study released by the University of Alberta's School of Business looking into the city's downtown retail landscape. It found roughly 33% of downtown storefronts are vacant right now. Some of the things that we discovered that are working in other communities are around a lot of beautification investments, uh, bringing more people back into the downtown core to actually live. Um, we were talking about how do we make it easy for people to get around in the downtown core. So just really making it as, as consumer focused as possible. Um, so people just want to be here and it's not a mandate to come back to work. It's, you want to be here because there's so many amazing things happening and it's just a great place to be. The study didn't get into safety, but Thompson says that improves when more people frequent the area. And to encourage that, business leaders and local politicians say restoring retail is key. As part of the Downtown Business Association's Downtown Retail Attraction Program, six new retailers are moving in. They're receiving $250,000 each to help offset their startup costs. And it has to be bringing a unique offering to downtown. Three of them were announced today. A brewery, a housewares and bake shop, and Good Goods, which will offer a wide range of socially responsible Canadian brands. Established three years ago, the co-owners say they're hopeful having a brick-and-mortar store in the city's downtown will help bring community together. There was a lot of really great vision that went into the downtown prior to COVID. And I think that we can all see that that opportunity still exists. Uh, we just need to be a part of the momentum that breathes that life back into it. Locations for the new retailers are still being worked out and opening dates are expected sometime early next year. Meantime, the other three successful businesses under this program will be revealed later this fall.
Alicia Asquith, CBC News, Edmonton. Tomorrow marks five years since the federal government legalized the use of cannabis in Canada. It was meant to improve safety and public health and to cut access to the drug by young people, criminals, and the illegal market. There has been some progress on some of those things, but parents, guardians, and healthcare providers are concerned about others. For more on this, where we are five years later, we're joined by our CBC Health columnist, Dr. Melissa Lem. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Dan. So the legal age to buy cannabis, similar to alcohol in this province, is 19. The Journal of American Medical Association says one-third of cannabis-related hospitalizations in parts of Canada from 2015 to 2021 were people 15 to 24, young group. What are the health risks, particularly for younger Canadians? Well, one thing we have to keep in mind is there's a difference between medical use of cannabis and recreational. So mm -hmm. medical use, it's legitimate for some seizure disorders and for nausea in cancer patients. But in young people, often the risks do outweigh the health benefits, for example. So some of the ways that you can um, cut down on the risks of cannabis use would be using it once a week instead of regularly, mm -hmm. because there's a higher risk when you use it daily, avoiding it completely during pregnancy and um, breastfeeding and also before you're driving in order to cut down on fetal issues and accidents. And then also choosing formulations with lower amounts of THC, which is the psychoactive component, right. and higher amounts of CBD because there are more mental health effects with that THC. And depending on a person's genetic makeup, for example, environmental factors come into play and people who use cannabis can develop, some of them can develop schizophrenia. What can you explain, how do you explain that risk? What we have to keep in mind is that brains are still developing until we hit our mid or late 20s. And when you flood those neural receptors with a psychoactive substance like cannabis, that can really affect its development. So people who use cannabis when they're younger have typically lower brain volumes. They often uh, have trouble with connectivity between the neurons and also their brains have to work harder to do the same job. And so when it comes to schizophrenia, we don't quite know what the mechanisms are behind it, but we do know that people with a family history of psychosis or schizophrenia have a higher risk of developing it when they use cannabis and also if you go to the emergency department with an episode of cannabis induced psychosis that within three years your risk of developing schizophrenia is is doubled and finally appreciate your time cannabis products have been used to decrease anxiety how does that work and are there any concerns there well, when you think about the mechanisms behind it, what typically happens is that GABA is increased in your amygdala, which is a neurotransmitter that kind of damps down that fight or flight response mm -hmm. that comes from that fear and emotion area of your brain. But the problem is, again, if you consume too much THC, that can reverse those effects and worsen anxiety. So that's why we say, again, choose lower THC and higher CBD formulations. And then, of course, there's always the risk of addiction and dependence with any psychoactive substance. So you have to try to lean into more lifestyle uh, management of your anxiety, like healthy diet, exercise, spending time outside, and sleep, and then forging those meaningful social connections. Lots to consider. Dr. Melissa Lem, we appreciate your time and your expertise. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dan. We've entered week two of the war between Israel and Hamas. The death toll is climbing as supplies in Gaza run out. More after the break. Rapongi is busy almost every night of the week. The reason is the entertainment. <laughs> 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 
this man is not a professional singer. He just came in for a few drinks and some fun with his friends. Now, thanks to this laser disc machine, he's part of tonight's entertainment. It's a sing-along machine. The words appear on the screen and you sing along to the pre-recorded instrumental tracks. And they put a lot of echo into the microphone so your voice doesn't sound too flat. If you want to participate, you just look at the song menu, choose a selection, and wait for your turn in the limelight. I mean, if you have a hard day and um, you work hard, and I think it's one way of releasing your frustration, I think. It's all arranged in Japan and other parts of the Orient, and it's only just hitting our shores, so a lot of the songs are in Chinese and Japanese. But you can try them phonetically if you want. This do-it-yourself entertainment is obviously good for business. It keeps the place lively, and people probably drink a bit more if they're going to get up and sing in front of the whole mob. All right, now, listen. Seriously here, this is a first for him and I, right? We've never done this before, okay? Now, this other guy up there is Rick Warren, a cameraman who's having a birthday. And I feel it's only fair to warn you that what you're about to see and hear is not pretty. The war between Israel and Hamas, a barrage of rockets fired at Jerusalem and Tel Aviv today as hospitals in Gaza inch toward the brink of collapse because of a lack of water, fuel and medical supplies. This comes as the death toll climbed higher with at least 1,300 Israelis and 2,800 Palestinians killed. Margaret Evans has more on today's developments. Don't let the sky fool you. There is no peace in this land. In Sturot, less than a kilometer from Israel's border with Gaza, it looks like people left in a hurry. And those who survived a murderous rampage by Hamas militants did. Not even the police station was safe. This is what's left of the police station now. Hamas militants came into town on the back of a pickup truck. They took over the station and killed some 30 people inside, including police officers and civilians. It was a hard-fought battle. To get them out, the Israeli army wound up bulldozing the building with the militants inside. Most of the town has now been evacuated. As Israel pounds Gaza from the sky and the sea and prepares its ground offensive. Israel has now increased the number of hostages it believes are being held by Hamas or other militant groups in Gaza to 200. A delegation of French politicians formed the biggest group in Stirot, here on a solidarity visit with Israel. 
former Prime Minister Manuel Valls saying Israel has the right to defend itself. The answer has to be strong and fair, he says. That's why a large part of the population of Gaza must be evacuated through humanitarian corridors. Diplomatic action is being taken to make it happen. Not soon enough for Gaza's dead. More than hundreds of thousands of civilians now corralled into southern Gaza after heeding Israel's warning to flee for their lives. And there they still live under siege. The UN warning of a humanitarian catastrophe, food, water, electricity, all increasingly scarce. Unlike the anger and despair. Zakaria al is a Palestinian with residency in the U.S. They think it's not people here. These people here, these people here live. It's not life. Foreign nationals waited all day at the Rafah crossing, hoping their countries would negotiate an exit for them. But they were disappointed. No deal and an Israeli strike. Wherever we go, there's shelling, crying, screaming and blood, says Hadil Abu Daoud. Seriously, we don't know what we should do. We're coming to the crossing knowing they won't open it. The U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, returned to Israel after days of shuttle diplomacy in the Arab world, fearful the conflict will escalate in the region. He met with the Israeli defense minister. This will be a long war. The price will be high, but we are going to win. At what cost is yet to be known, but it is already writ large. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Southern Israel. Ottawa says it's doing all it can to get Canadians out of conflict zones. Today, as Paul Hunter reports, it was announced 30 people, most of them Canadians, had traveled from the occupied West Bank to Jordan by bus. At Rafa, the Gaza Strip's southern border crossing with Egypt, the gates are still shut tight as desperation grows. Some 300 Canadians are among those trapped in Gaza while Israeli airstrikes continue. And as efforts by Canada and others to negotiate a way out for foreign nationals have failed. Among those stuck, Palestinian Canadian Asia Mathkor and her family who recorded this message to send to CBC News. The families are going uh, near, us, near us right now, and uh, we are scared that any, 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 any minute, any second, a bomb could drop us next to, uh, next to us, and then we'll be all collateral damage. We have no time to be safe. We need, to, we need Canadians to be moving. Meanwhile, success today for 21 Canadian nationals in a Canadian government-organized bus journey out of the West Bank and into Jordan. More may follow. The West Bank is not part of what's happening in Gaza, but tensions here are high, as are fears that what's happening in Gaza could spread. But by no means do all Palestinian Canadians want to leave. This is where I belong. Sasha, who asked that we not identify her for fear of Israeli reprisal, is Palestinian Canadian and spent much of her life in Ontario and B.C as we stood on a street in Ramallah. She worried if too many Palestinians were to up and leave or if they didn't stay and fight for change, nothing ever will. I'm against things calming down now and I am fully, fully in support of just things going insane to the, to the extreme. Even if, if it meant losing my own life, my family, anything, I'm willing to sacrifice in order to have this country uh, be in a better place for once. It's a nightmare, to be honest. It's a nightmare. Sabri Saidam with the Fatah party, which controls parts of the occupied West Bank, echoes some of Sasha's defiance. He knows Palestinians in Gaza are running for their lives, but worries if too many now flee there and in the West Bank, the Palestinian battle for nationhood could be lost. You're saying to, to Palestinian Canadians here, stay, don't leave, stay. I would say, you know, the matter of movement is a personal choice. But collectively, I would say uh, Palestinians are Palestinians. Uh, they decide on their fate. I would say we all have to stay put. To stay or to go in Gaza and in the West Bank, the desperate dilemma for Palestinians. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Ramallah.
New tonight, U.S. President Joe Biden is planning to visit Israel on Wednesday as the conflict grinds on. Meanwhile, Justin Trudeau provided an update on the Canadian government's efforts in the region today. We're now from Catherine Cullen. There are so many people in Canada who are afraid of the escalating tension here at home. The crisis half a world away is hitting here, says the Prime Minister, citing rising anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. This is a time to reach out, to support one another. This was the first time politicians gathered in the House of Commons since Hamas's brutal attack over a week ago. All parties emphasized the need for a humanitarian corridor to deliver supplies to those suffering in Gaza. It is imperative that this happen. The Prime Minister noted the first bus of Canadians was able to get out of the West Bank and said they are working incessantly to try to get Canadians out of Gaza. He called for international law to be upheld and for Hamas to release its hostages, saying three Canadians may be among them. But let me also be extremely clear that Hamas does not represent the Palestinian people nor their legitimate aspirations. They do not speak for Muslim or Arab communities. The Conservatives hammered that message. Hamas is a sadistic, criminal, terrorist death cult, and it must be defeated. There was no negotiating with bin Laden, and there can be no negotiating with Hamas. Pierre Polyev called for a review to ensure no aid goes to Hamas, something the government insists it is already ensuring. The NDP are pushing for a different course. Killed. Israelis and Palestinians have the right to live in peace. Why won't this government stand up for international law and call for a ceasefire? Here, here. A call the government is not embracing. Our government is very clear that we support the state of Israel. And we recognize Israel's right to defend itself within international law. The Prime Minister called on Canadians to hold on to their core values, including freedom of speech and respect for one another. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. A sport with billions of fans around the world is returning to the Olympics after a century-long break. More after this break. Some cucumbers, you can still see quite a bit are growing in here, which is why we haven't pulled everything out yet. Executive Director of Green Igloo, Reagan Solotki, checks on produce in a research greenhouse in her backyard. She says her experience in the north of working out how to grow produce year-round is now helping Albertans. Coming from Inuvik in the Northwest Territories, my image of Alberta is, there's so many farms, this is the land of milk and honey. Well, it's not. There's still people that are struggling. Her organization helps communities and food banks set up greenhouses and geodesic growing domes with heating and cooling systems. We actually have to insulate it. So we use Reflectech insulation, which is also involved in the geodesic dome, which will help when the sun comes in to heat up. And we use all sorts of thermal mass measures to try to limit the electrical input that we have to use. Across town, tucked away behind Red Deer's food bank, Mitch Thompson says their 26-foot wide dome built there this summer is already making a difference. Domes like this where you can grow food 12 months of the year have been proven in our Arctic areas. So being able to do that here in Red Deer just makes sense. Uh, it allows us to grow tomatoes and peppers, cucumbers and zucchini, all to help support the people that we serve and ensure they have something fresh to eat all year round. I'm going to pick some tomatoes. Green Igloo's also helping the food bank set up a new hydroponic sea can growing system, as well as hosting a food security forum in the city later this month. Dan McGarvey, CBC News, Red Deer. Three, two, one. Pixel Park is a temporary play space as the future of this part of the entertainment district isn't known yet. But the Calgary Municipal Land Corporation has packed a lot into a small space, including a skateboard park, a basketball hoop, a pickleball court, a fenced off-leash dog park, and next door, 
24 electric vehicle chargers. The head of CMLC, Kate Thompson, says Pixel Park should attract nearby apartment dwellers looking for some room to stretch. The Pixel Park was inspired by uh, obviously our, our video game uh, world that we live in and uh, how we typically play. And this is a really playful spot. So um, bringing in that same metaphor into the design of this space makes a lot of sense for us to maybe have people take a pause from their screens and get out and play in the physical environment. The area's city councillor, Courtney Walcott, says as the population of the Beltline continues to grow, there's a demand for these kind of spaces, even if they are temporary. These things are valuable because it shows that this is community building immediately. The moment it's ready, community's trying to get in. CMLC is offering sports equipment rentals at the park on Fridays and weekends. Scott Dipple, CBC News, Calgary. Darius Madavi joins us with the full forecast province-wide. Certainly in the south coast, if you looked outside today, whoosh, a lot of that stuff falling from the sky. Whoosh is right. Mm -hmm. Do you want to see why, Dan? Yes, indeed. It all Everybody starts does. across the Pacific, mm. way over. Uh, That's off, several kilometers away. At least, yeah. Uh, so we have uh, a, a typhoon that actually developed into a super typhoon, the equivalent of a Category 5 hurricane uh, that was making its way up the coast. Fortunately, very few impacts were felt, uh, just some sort of some remnant moisture that made its way on shore. But now that moisture is making its way to us. So if we take a look here, you can see this is the remnant moisture from that typhoon that has made its way over the ocean, and that is now going to be pushing over the south coast. So this is really uh, an atmospheric river that's going to be pushing over. Uh, it's moderate strength, so it's not going to cause too much. Uh, uh, I mean, 200 millimeters of rain in some parts of the island is definitely significant, but we have seen worse. But keep in mind, localized flooding, very possible over the next few days because of all that rain that we're going to see build up across the area. So here I've added uh, some totals so you can see how much rain you're expecting in your area. By far, Tofino with triple digits is the most that we have up here, but keep in mind higher elevations can expect even more and some pretty significant rainfall for the inland and eastern parts of the island, which don't usually see quite so much rain. Now, wind gusts are the other uh, uh, sort of warning that we have in place from the government. By uh, over Haida Gwaii, we're looking at easily winds reaching 90 kilometers per hour. Now, these are gusts, so we can get higher, and we will expect to get higher over 100 kilometers per hour for some parts. But just to give you an idea of how significant those wind gusts are going to be, uh, we're just having that run through. Now, tomorrow, mm -hmm. just expect, for the most part, a little bit of rain. Uh, sorry, not a little bit. A lot of rain across the coast, a little bit potentially making its way into the southeast, and then cloud just building into the interior over the next few days as that system starts to push in. And for Vancouver, mostly just some rainfall at the beginning of this week. And then we get a lower chance, but mm -hmm. then some sunny skies by the end of the week. Okay. And we're filling up the reservoirs. Yep. Good news there. There you go. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Dan. The International Olympic Committee added five more sports to the slate today. One of them is cricket. As Salima Shivji reports, observers say the sport's global popularity makes this a good business decision for the IOC. The excitement is contagious at this World Cup cricket match, especially when the Indian team bus rolls up. The players on a hot streak. What an atmosphere here in Delhi. With hosts India dominating to the delight of their fans, here with one goal in mind. Celebrating for India. Cricket is known as a religion, right? We can't skip the opportunity not seeing the batsmen play. They will soon have a new opportunity to see cricket on the world stage, one of five sports added to the 2028 Olympic Games in Los Angeles. A decision made official in Mumbai. So the proposal is approved. Uh... This is the ultimate win-win-win for late 28, the IOC and the cricket community, as cricket will be showcased on a global stage. For fans here, it's a no-brainer. The massively popular game has been absent from the world's biggest sporting stage since 1900. It's a sport that is being played across the, 
all of the Asia right now. You know how popular now it has become. So it is important to be the part of that because Olympic is Olympic. That is the mecca of sports. Yes, I believe there is a need for it. India will surely secure the gold. But this decision, of course, not only for the fans. It's a solid business move for the International Olympic Committee, angling for the huge market in South Asia and all of the revenue that will come from TV broadcasting rights with cricket in play. A big boost for the games and the sports image, especially if the stars show up, but not one that will necessarily attract new fans. Uh, I mean, we've seen it in other sports, say for example, baseball, softball in the past Olympic Games. They haven't really grown the game beyond the usual borders. Uh, so I doubt if cricket will achieve that target. Still, the borders are already wide for cricket, the second most popular sport in the world, soon back to Olympic heights. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Mumbai. I don't know if many of you know that this flute is measured at 432 hertz. According to scientists and people all over the world, that frequency is a universal frequency. It's a frequency that's, that's heard by our trees, by the birds, by the animals, by the earth. It has so much powerful connection with us as human beings, and it gives us such a healing property a healing tool that we could use. So I'm gonna take a few seconds here to explain to you a little exercise that I practice often, and it's called deep breathing. So everybody close your eyes. With every single inhale through your nose, you're gonna think of the people that are closest to you, the people that inspired you to be who you are, the people that make you matter. The people to you that matter. You're going to think about beautiful energy. You're going to think about our lost children at the residential schools. You're going to think about everything that means the world to you. And you're going to inhale all of that positive energy. And when you exhale, you're going to exhale everything that's sort of weighing heavy on your, soul, your shoulders. Things that you know, make you have a hard time. And you're gonna release that with every single exhale. And we'll, we'll see what your body tells you after 30 seconds of this flute. For years, people have been sharing an online image of a woman playing Game Boy surrounded by four youngsters. And as Dan Plaster reveals, the famous photo was taken in Canada. Do you remember this meme? For more than 10 years, it's been shared across the internet. It started in 2012 on Reddit's r gaming. 
The mystery surrounding this wholesome family moment was finally solved by internet sleuth, YouTuber Sakura Stardust. The family photo was taken in Prince Albert's, and the mom in the middle is Deborah Tooley. I decided to just search Reddit specifically and find the, um, the earliest post. And um, that's when I found Zoza Cloud's um, original post from 2011. I couldn't find anything before that. The difference with those posts, um, with the later posts and that one specifically, is that he referred to um, he referred to the mother in the photo as his own mother. He just messaged me out of the blue, and she's like, "Do you mind if I asked you a few questions and maybe did a video?" I said, "Absolutely, yeah." I posted on Reddit back in 2012, and just an innocent, "Here's my mom in a cute photo." So they would come over and they they get to that level, they bring it over to me and say, "Okay, Auntie Debbie, or Mom." get us past this level. And they were watching to see how I did it so they could recreate that. It blew up like millions of views in a matter of weeks. And we just didn't expect that. I grew up in the 90s playing like Mario Kart with my mom um, or like Super Mario World, stuff like that. And while I don't have a lot of photos of us playing video games together, that photo in itself and their story behind the photo just reminds me so much of my mom. It wasn't until um, Sakura and Scott sort of got together on this little project that I realized how popular it was and it's not necessarily just here it's like all over the world like other languages and stuff so it just blew me away. We couldn't be more proud that she'd really put justice to uh, to our memory. Love it. Thanks for being with us tonight. Tanya Fletcher will have your next local news at 11 o'clock. Have a good night.